Um, next, we will move on to Dr. Christine Palmer, assistant professor at Castleton University, who's conducting biological research to provide a comprehensive analysis of fungi and bacteria across multiple regions of Iceland. And this is going to help um, identify conditions for successful seedling establishment in subarctic forests. And of course, that's very, very important here. Um, and Palmer's working with the Icelandic forest uh, research on this project. So there's a great interest in her work here in Iceland. She's been living up in Mogilsau, surrounded by nature busy with her project and working with her colleagues, but she's also picked up an amazing level of the Icelandic language dur during her time here. But I'm going to leave that all to her to tell you about. So Palmer, um, please uh, take the floor. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen here. And I apologize, my internet is a little bit slower. Um, so uh, that's why I've kept my sound and video off. But uh, can you can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. And unfortunately, you can probably see me. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna do I'm gonna talk to you a little bit and give you a little bit of science and then a little bit of the personal experience. Uh, so I'm working with the Icelandic Forest Service here in Iceland, and there's really two branches. Uh, there's the Forest Service, and then there's a specific research branch. And that research branch is at Mukasau, which is where I'm based. It's a it's a bit north of Reykjavik, a beautiful spot. Lots of people come here to hike up the mountain. You'll see forests here. It's just been an amazing place. Um, and I am a, a associate professor of biology in the United States in Vermont. And then of course the Fulbright NSF Arctic Research Scholar here. And these are just a few photos of the, the organisms <laughs> that I'm studying. Uh, sometimes you have to look below the ground to see some of what's out there. Um, so I always introduce myself, you, you know me a little bit, but I uh, actually have a background in molecular biology and genetics. So it's been really fun to get to work in a natural system and take the tools of looking at the tiny stuff and apply it to a system where people often don't have access to all of that. Um, I also run the wildlife and forest conservation program at my university. So it's been incredibly uh, eye-opening and a lot of fun to be able to work with the forest service here, especially because it's such a small place. In the United States, to know everyone in the Forest Service would be hilarious, but in Iceland, you can pretty much know everyone in the Forest Service, so that's been a real delight. Uh, and my, my interest in research is really understanding how organisms deal with incredibly difficult situations, and my favorite organisms are plants. Uh, and the reason for that is for you and I, right, if we're in a difficult situation, we're cold, we're hungry, we can get up and leave and go somewhere else. If you're a plant, you're stuck where you are, so you have to come up with some better solutions. So that's been sort of my goal here is to understand uh, how the trees are surviving some pretty challenging situations and try and improve that working with forestry. So uh, I use all sorts of tools in biology. If you're a biologist, uh, often you specialize in something. I have the uh, good fortune and bad fortune of being a generalist, so I can do it all okay. <laughs> um, so I study everything from the tiny all the way up to the big. Uh, and here in Iceland, my, my host, as I mentioned, is Icelandic Forest Research, um, specifically Etta Oddsdottir. So she is the head of Icelandic Forest Research at Mokasau. And conveniently, she actually studies the same uh, fungus that grows under the ground. And so it's turned out to be a quite a fun partnership. And so I work with Skolreikten, which is the Forest Service. Um, so as I mentioned, I love plants and I really love trees. And I've had the great fortune of being able to work with some amazing trees around the world. You know, everything from the 4,000, 5,000 year old bristlecone pine in, in the high desert in California, struck by lightning, knocked over by wind, you know, up 5,000 meters uh, to, you know, giant sequoia to all sorts of different plants. But it's really fun to study trees here. Uh, they are not this big. <laughs> Uh, the joke here is that if you find yourself lost in an Icelandic forest, just stand up. Uh, I would like to dispel that notion, by the way. Uh, there are some perfectly delightful forests that you can get lost in. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've tried it and it, it works. <laughs> so there are some, some beautiful forests here. So I think people have this notion that forests don't grow in Iceland and they don't belong here. And that's definitely not true. Iceland was actually highly forested before the Vikings came, probably about 40% forest. 
now we're about um, maybe 1.5% forested. So it, it should be forested, uh, but it was uh, mostly cut down and burned by the Vikings. Um, so the two things that I work on now, uh, one of them is uh, working in how insects eat trees. It's kind of the flip side, where what happens to trees afterwards uh, in Panama using molecular tools. And then the other side is how to get trees to establish and be healthy uh, in places and looking really at what's happening below ground. So this is where uh, the Fulbright has come in. Uh, I have a research program in the United States, in New England, and it pairs really nicely with the work here in Iceland. And so it's been really fun to be able to leverage my colleagues in the United States with uh, the colleagues here. And you can use very similar tools to ask, ask similar questions. And yet each system can learn from the other one. So it's been a really uh, rewarding thing for me. So let me give you a little bit of the science just so you uh, can see what, what's going on there. So I study something called mycorrhizae uh, or mycorrhizal fungi or fungi, depending on how you like to say it. And the word quite literally means fungus, mycor, rhizy, root. Uh, probably most people don't realize this, but much of a tree root is actually fungus. Um, the roots of a tree are not very good at taking up things from the environment. They're quite inefficient. And so almost every plant requires a fungal friend or many fungal friends to basically form like a super root network. And so these are really fine roots, smaller than any tree could ever produce. And so if you dig below a plant, especially trees, they're very visible, you'll find this, it almost looks like the ground is fuzzy. And it's just this network of, of fungal roots that are hooked up to the tree. And so that's this partnership where the tree provides sugar through photosynthesis for the fungus. And in return, the fungus says, thank you for the sugar. I will give you some water, some nitrogen, some phosphorus, the things you really need to be able to continue to do photosynthesis and grow and survive. Um, so it's a beautiful partnership. It's a very tight partnership. Uh, they're in it together, but they also don't hand things out freely. Um, but most plant species require these fungus. And I think a lot of people don't know that. That's kind of cool. Um, there are many groups of these mycorrhizae, but the two main ones we think about are called arbuscular endo, endo like in. Um, and this group basically pokes a hole in the side of the uh, root cell and grows into the root cell to be able to take up all that sugar. Um, they must have plants to survive. And there are a lot more of these in tropical and temperate regions. Most plants have these. Trees, on the other hand, have something called ecto, ecto on the outside. And so these are fungi that grow around the root. Uh, they don't actually poke a hole. They actually surround it. And you find a lot more of these in uh, temperate or boreal and arctic regions. So uh, here in Iceland, most of the fungi that you'll see associated with plants are going to be these ectomycorrhizae. And they're especially important for trees. Uh, so most tree species can't survive without these friends, which is a pretty cool thing. Here in Iceland, the trees that are planted uh, depends on how much you know about Iceland. There is a very strong uh, discussion over which tree species have, should be planted here. Uh, as a scientist, it's a lot of fun because I can kind of remain a step out from the politics of it. Uh, but there are some very strong opinions. I'm not going to tell you which ones are right or wrong. <laughs> um, all of them have some merit, right? Uh, so the native species are really birch and those indeed, you know, I'm taller than most of the birch trees. Uh, there's some willow that's native and there's rowan. But much of what's being planted by the Forest Service are uh, tree species that are not native. Uh, some of them come from somewhere fairly nearby, you know, something you might find in Norway that could have gotten here. But Iceland is quite young, really. Uh, so there are not a lot of uh, tree species here yet. So the species that are being planted, pine, spruce, fir, larch, birch trees, um, also willow and uh, willow and rowan and uh, populus, some people call asp. Uh, this is the one that people tend to be the most strongly opinionated about. <laughs> uh, but these are all tree species that need these ectomycorrhizae to survive. So uh, if you want to be able to grow the trees, you have to make sure the fungus is there to support the tree. Um, so again, these are very, very important. Uh, there's a lot of things these fungi do. Uh, and I've put it out here, which kind does what. And you'll see that ecto, the ones that grow on the outside, show up for pretty much every single useful thing. Um, the arbuscular that we find more in the tropics do fewer services. 
so here in Iceland, the fungi are especially important. So they help take up uh, nutrients. So nitrogen, incredibly important here in Iceland where the soils are, well, sometimes brand new. Right from this window, I can see some new soils coming out of the volcano, quite literally. <laughs> so if anyone is here in Iceland, you've, you've been seeing the eruption happening. Um, so there are constantly these new soils that have never had anything in them before. So there's certainly no nitrogen there. Um, and there's also not been any fungus either. So how do you deal with a system where you don't have the friends yet? Um, so these mycorrhizae can help uh, provide nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, uh, lots of micro and macronutrients. Um, they can help protect against drought, which you might not think is a problem in Iceland, but actually the soils drain so fast that a lot of the soil, the tree death is because there are droughts. Uh, the West Fjords is, is actually up there, a lot of their trees they lose because they have these dry spells. You don't think of that in Iceland, but um, can be protection against pathogens and predators. There aren't a lot of insects here yet, but as the trees get planted, the insects show up. Um, so they'll be actually chewing on the roots and they can kill the trees. It's quite high mortality uh, here in seedlings um, by weevils and some other. And then very relevant, especially um, Lucas talked about this in the talking about some of the Arctic goals. So carbon storage, carbon sequestration has become a huge uh, priority here in Iceland. It's hard to reduce your heating footprint. Oh, it's geothermal, your electricity, oh, it's hydro. Uh, so being able to actually lock up carbon through uh, carbon sequestration by growing trees is a big thing. And most of the carbon that you lock up is actually below the soil. So in Arctic regions, almost all the carbon is below the ground. Yeah, so big, big role there. So as I mentioned, I look at two different systems. So in New England, back in the United States, the goal is to look below the ground to understand how do the fungi change when you go from one set of tree species to another. So, you know, I don't have to tell you about climate change. Um, there are a lot of tree species that we're going to lose, um, either because of pathogens uh, that are now able to survive because of the rising temperatures. Um, but there's a lot of tree species that are, that are dying or that are going to change in New England. And so we're trying to understand, or across the United States really, we're trying to understand who's there now below the ground. Will they be able to help out the trees that we're trying to establish for future forest? Um, so that's what I'm doing in on the New England, on the yeah, United States side. In Iceland, it's similar, same tools. We're going to use molecular biology to look and see who's there. But the difference here is you're going from nothing to something, right? United States, you're going from something to something different, one forest to a different forest. In Iceland, most of the time, you're going from nothing, no forest is there, or very little has been there. So do you even have any of the fungal friends that you need to new forests and often species that weren't in Iceland before? So they very likely don't have their friends here. Um, so this is what we're trying to understand is to use these tools to figure out if the fungus that we need is present. And if it's not, when do we need to add it? Where can we get away with it that it's already present? Um, so that's really the work that we're doing here. Uh, and I should say that the previous tools, so as I mentioned, um, Etta here, my host, uh, she did some research on this, but the tools have really changed a lot. And so I'm able to use molecular biology and bioinformatics to take a much um, deeper look at this. So before the tools were quite limited and labor intensive. So uh, it's been fun to be able to bring something new, you know, a new tool to look at the system. So I'll just give you a quick overview in the interest of time to try not to get too deep in the details. But the idea is to go around Iceland. Um, and these are the sites that I have collected from. Uh, I was here in August in September uh, before the Fulbright started, actually, as a, a essential tourist, I guess. <laughs> um, so I was able to come and collect samples before the ground froze and while I could still see the leaves on the trees to identify the species. So I drove around Iceland. Uh, I was able to visit Laura. I highly recommend it. Uh, she's a very knowledgeable and great tour guide. Um, but I, so I drove around Iceland, collected from a number of different sites. Uh, then I bring the samples back to the lab extract the DNA. So DNA is what's inside every cell. It's your blueprint, but it is also the way that we'll be able to figure out what species are there. Um, do some molecular biology to basically find the fingerprints of everybody who's in there. I won't talk about <laughs> the specifics of uh, the bioinformatics, but do some awesome analysis <clears throat> and then figure out who's there. Um, so just very briefly, uh, 
The sites around Iceland represented a whole range of forest types. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet a large number of folks in forestry. So these are people who either I met with directly um, or helped advise me. Uh, many of these people have now become quite good friends of mine. It's just a, a beautiful thing. Uh, it's a lot of fun to work with it. I would say the Forest Service, these are people who are just awesome. <laughs> it's frau, but not frau, but. So it's, it's hard to overstate how fantastic these folks have been. Um, and then represent a whole range of different, different questions. So what do we expect to see for fungal friends in different types of forest? What should there be? What do we hope they'll be? So it's able to look at uh, different species of trees, forests. Uh, how about what does it look like in a brand new forest? You know, lava field with some freshly planted trees versus a forest that's actually been here for 50 years and is doing pretty well. What do you see for fungal friends in those healthy forests? What are we aiming for? Um, <clears throat> looking across different forest types, what is it like in a really eroded? There's a lot of erosion here, right? You take away the trees, the wind blows. Uh, <clears throat> one thing that's been very surprising about Iceland is how incredibly windy it is. It's actually not very cold. It's just really windy. It makes uh, the storms in New England look hilarious. I'm like <laughs> 15 meters per second, but a lock, you know, it's just a calm day. That's silly. Uh, and then some testing some sites that have different treatments, fertilizer or <clears throat> adding some fungus. So tried to represent a lot. Um, I've probably actually collected too much. Uh, so the number of different collaborations I have right now for different research projects is um, exciting. Um, so once you go to the sites to collect samples, we basically just dig these uh, holes in the ground. Uh, at each site, I will take a meter uh, circle and take three cores, about 10 centimeters deep, and pool them together. You're trying to make sure that you don't get the one weird spot. So by taking three spots and pooling them together, you get a nice representation of that spot. Um, and then uh, for each site, you take all sorts of extra information because you don't know what'll be useful later, right? So you take latitude, longitude, elevation, um, what are all the plant species you see there? What, what did the soil look like? What was the particle size? Take lots of photos, um, especially if I can actually detect any mycorrhizae. So this is um, <clears throat> very high tech photography. Uh, it's a hand lens with an iPad, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but they actually worked quite well and it's easy to bring in the field. Uh, so I was able to get these images out there. Then you bring them back to the lab and basically take soil and crush it up by shaking it with beads. And you also add some chemicals, kind of like soaps to burst open all of the cells. Um, if you remember, I mentioned that fungus coats the root and is good at protecting it from things. That also means that it's really tough. So it's hard to break these open. So you have to really give it everything to break these open to get to the DNA inside. So then you end up with a tube that's filled with DNA. And this DNA represents anything that was there. The fungus, the tree root, the insect that died, the fox that walked by and pooped. Whatever DNA is in that spot, it's going to be in this tube, uh, which is exciting because it means that in the future I can look at other things from these same samples. But for now, I really just want to see the fungus, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to use something called a barcode. Uh, and it's similar from what you're thinking, you know, scan the barcode. Uh, it's essentially a fingerprint of an organism. And it's a specific reason in the DNA that uh, is specific to those groups of organisms. And there'll be little differences. So it's like us, you know, fingerprint. All humans, well, most humans have fingers, right? And we're going to look at the thumb. Okay, we're clearly not looking at foxes because they don't have a thumbprint. So we've already ruled out that. And everybody has a thumb, so I need to just go look for the thumbs. But the specifics of what the thumb looks like will be a little different between. So it's nice because you basically have a thing you can look at that everyone has, but it'll be a little different between individuals. So you'll be able to tell exactly who's there. Like, who's on this meeting? Everybody, give me a thumbprint. You know, you all have a thumb, but it'll look a little different. So that's, that's what we're basically using to go after who's out there. Um, and there's a different region for different groups of organisms. So uh, I'm going to be looking at the fungal region, right? So we'll use this particular fingerprint. And we use this tool to be able to just end up with a tube that's just got all the fingerprints for just the fungi. But the cool thing about this is I can go back later and say, ooh, we're also interested in the bacteria. Or, ooh, you want to use that tool for insects. I can do that too. So this is a, a fun tool, but it's relatively uh, straightforward.
The hard part, which I'm not going to talk about, is the sequence, the bioinformatics. Um, it's actually really like I gave you all one piece of paper and you all put your fingerprint on top of each other. And you did it a lot of times because you weren't sure if it worked. So I have this one tiny piece of paper with a whole bunch of ugly ink on it. And I have to figure out whose fingerprint is whose. And so this part uh, is pretty intensive. Um, right now I'm in this part of the process. So uh, soon I'll be doing a lot of analysis and enough so that I have time to go back and collect more samples for places that I need. So it's exciting. <clears throat> so the end goal here, the outcomes are to try and figure out what fungal species do you need to have a healthy forest? So by looking at healthy forests, new forests, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and the goal is to try and figure out how do you apply this to forestry? You know, here forestry is such a, a small um, group of people that it really needs to be applicable quite quickly. It's fun to figure things out just to understand, but really you want to be able to use it to improve things. So if we can understand, hey, you know, when you go to a, the lava sites near um, Hecla, there really aren't any fungal spores there. You're going to have to add some fungus if you want your trees to survive. But you know what? Over by, you know, easy field, there's actually tons because of the way the wind blows. Don't worry about it. Just plant your trees. Um, so the idea is to try and take this to understand how we can apply it and how we know when we have the fungus we need and when you don't have the friends you need to survive. Uh, so that's the research outcome. From the professional standpoint, it would be hard for me to overstate how um, how much of a game changer this has been for me. Um, so at my university, I you know I teach this force or I lead this forest conservation program. I teach classes in this, uh, and so uh, I even take a class here every couple of years. I'm incredibly excited to go back and share not only the things I've learned here but the connections. Uh, it's just it's a, a, such a different way of looking at things and yet similar in some ways too. So I'm really excited to share both the culture and the content of what I've learned here. Um, and then from a very personal standpoint, the number of research projects and collaborations that have happened in the last six months uh, just blows my mind. It's so much fun. It's fun to be able to bring something to the table, but then you learn something in return. Uh, so the uh, I will be here again, undoubtedly, whether they want me or not, <laughs> um, because there's just so many ongoing things and uh, it's been a lot of fun. So the last thing I just wanted to share, yeah, so the, there are a couple other things that weren't part of the Fulbright, but have become possible because of it. Uh, the Forest Service are very good at capitalizing on the skill sets they see. <laughs> so I ended up learning how to run some tools that I didn't know how to do. Um, I even got involved somehow in producing some PR material for the Forest Service. So uh, this is in English, um, but uh, this is a YouTube video of uh, Icelandic forestry. Um, somehow I ended up <laughs> as the and the, the I, I made it up as I went, but uh, the the catchphrase of it's a win-win. They really like that, so that's been fun. Um, I've also given some lectures for them. Uh, I taught a bioinformatics course for the Forest Service. Um, and hopefully that will be ongoing because it's a tool that I think will help them. And the, it was fun to teach it and fun to help them with their data. Um, and then I've been able to use some of the tools to help some of the folks with their research here take new approaches to that. And these are for me just for fun, um, but it's been a, a nice thing to feel incredibly integrated and useful. So uh, I'm not just here for the research I want to do. It's actually you're part of the team, which is amazing. Um, and then there's an incredible crossover between professional and personal connections. In particular, the Forest Service is really a family. They have coffee together each morning. They have lunch together. Um, they truly care about each other. It's an amazing, they can probably hear me because they're about to have lunch together now. <laughs> Icelanders don't generally compliment super very much. So this would be awkward if they could hear me, but we'll just pretend they can't. Um, <laughs> uh, but this has become something that is uh, become friendships that built to last. So uh, I have been really lucky. I think it's very hard in Iceland to break in. Um, Icelanders are amazing. If you're really in trouble, they'll be there for you. But I think it's uh, difficult to become part of the culture, especially in a short amount of time. Uh, so I've been really lucky because uh, I've, I've just been really welcomed here. Um, so everything from uh, I've been taught, this is one of the uh, Forest Service folks teaching me to knit. Um, 
I try to bring what I can. So this is sugar on snow. Uh, one of the days it snowed at Mocha Sal, I had brought maple syrup. And so I went, oh, I got a pan of snow and I brought it in and I boiled my syrup down. And <laughs> so they all had uh, sugar on snow. Um, you know, I got to share in the uh, Easter eggs. Um, I've never eaten so much chocolate in one day before. <laughs> what a great tradition. <laughs> uh, uh, this is um, Ostergaard. Um, I was informed that morning that you dress up on this day, and so I couldn't leave my colleague without, you know, some moral support, but didn't really have a costume, so I just looked around the house and it seemed like being a lamp was a great idea. Um, gotten to go fishing. Uh, this is a fish within a fish here. Um, just the number of different things that have been able to experience the culture, you know, um, I, I can't overstate it, but it's, it's been a complete blast. And then, of course, from the natural side, uh, I'm a biologist. I'm an outdoor enthusiast. I've gotten to see some amazing places and gotten to go on some incredible adventures. Iceland is epic, is the best word to say. Um, you know, even uh, uh, Laura was showing me some pictures. This is up in Hornstrander. I was helping uh, restore, repair an old farmhouse. Um, and at the same time, I'm doing a fundraiser for a soup kitchen at home. So I <clears throat> swam in the cold water to raise money. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say, this was something Belinda planted as a question, you know, things that surprised you. Um, there have been lots of things, you know, Iceland has uh, surprised me with how down to earth people are, how genuine is. Uh, the gender equality has been incredibly refreshing. I, I didn't realize how far we have to go until uh, being in a place that's much closer to it. Um, I... You know, there's just so many things. I love how connected to the world Icelanders are. Um, they're quite forward thinking. Um, there's just a lot of different things. But the biggest thing that I wanted to mention that surprised me or that uh, really struck me, and I hope this will help maybe future Fulbrighters, is how incredibly important being able to speak some of the languages. Um, it's what's opened the door. And so folks here are amazing English, right? And if you ask, they will always be glad to talk to you in English. But when there's a group of folks, the language always switches to Icelandic and no one's trying to be rude, no one's trying to exclude you. Um, but as you learn the language, uh, you can now be part of the lunchtime and the silly talks and the, uh, so it's hard for me to overstate what a difference learning the language has been. Now I'm terrible at it, um, but I'm just good enough that it's great entertainment. Uh, so for example, I'll just give you one. So hopefully this doesn't scare people from trying to learn it, but um, uh, I, one of my colleagues here runs the local shooting range. And so, uh, you know, I went shooting. Um, <clears throat> so I told one of my other colleagues, yeah, Priscilla's dying. She knows what I'm saying. So it turns out, I am shooting right now. <clears throat> Is something you do in the toilet by yourself, not with someone else. Um, <clears throat> so there have been some of those <laughs> uh, <laughs> where I've, um, uh, y'all definitely missed the mark. <laughs> um, but I would say learning the language has made it just absolutely incredible experience. Um, and all of these words, I, I'm trying to collect as many of the awesome words. Um, I'm made fun of that frauba is probably maybe aisle. Those are my favorite words in Icelandic. Um, in English too, awesome. Uh, so I would just end with that, that that has been the thing that most struck me that I wish I had known as a Fulbright coming in, that, you know, we say language is optional. Um, I would word it much more heavily that we strongly recommend that you learn the language or enough that mm -hmm. uh, you can talk before you come because that, that's been the game changer uh, for me. Um, and with that, I will end. Uh, this is, in fact, Icelandic trees. These are unusually large birch. Uh, so most of my time driving around collecting samples, uh, I slept in my hinkerum. Um, uh, so talk for me. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, um, so we're going to continue with three additional Fulbright NSF Arctic scholar presentations. So we're staying in the Arctic for this segment. Um, uh, so these scholars have, have not all been in Iceland for a very long time. Some have been a little bit longer than others, but we asked them to present today 
Um, so in some cases, instead of only focusing on the results of what they're been, what they've been doing, they'll also be focusing on what they plan to do during their Fulbright, right? Because they're so recently arrived. Um, yes, so so we're going to start the afternoon off with um, geologist Dr. Sarah Rathburn who is an associate professor of Colorado State University in Fort Collins. I've actually had the pleasure of visiting uh, Colorado State and the commission actually has an MOU with, with, with CSU uh, giving a full tuition waiver to an Icelandic student who receives a, a Fulbright grant. And that's to attend the graduate school really in, in, in any field. So, um, you know, if you know of any Icelandic students who are interested in doing their graduate studies uh, in the U.S. and in Colorado at a great university, they should talk to Sarah. Um, since we have someone here right now uh, who, you know, who, who actually lives and works there. She's hosted by the University of Iceland, the Institute of Earth Sciences, and she's going to be splitting her time between Reykjavik and North Iceland. Uh, Sarah's actually looking at an issue of great importance, uh, the role of bank erosion in contributing to landscape degradation, uh, with the name of identifying effective species and plants um, and planting density to, to maintain bank cohesion and guide afforestation efforts. And like we already heard from, from, from Laura, you know, forestation is such a big issue here. So Sarah, we're, we're just very interested to hear more about your project, please. Thank you very much, Brenda. And thank you for hosting. Um, I will share my screen. Can everyone see this? Mm, not yet. No, not yet. Okay, hang on. I'm working on just my laptop, so I need to make sure I can do this. Speaker view, full screen, more. All right, does someone have a suggestion? I have speaker view, gallery view, full screen. Do I have the host? Victor and- You should be able to share your screen, yes. Okay, got so if it. You click, yes, so if you click share screen, then you can choose which, there we go. Okay. Yes. And I just put slideshow on, so let me know when that goes. Yes. Okay, looks good? Yes. Great, all right. Thank you so much, Belinda, for that kind introduction. Thank you for hosting this fabulous workshop, this mini symposium where I get to hear about other people's research. And I'm really looking forward to meeting more of you in person. So I'll be presenting the ideas behind my research here in Iceland because I have zero data. And giving a scientific talk with no data is anathema to what we do as scientists. So I'll also be presenting some information on a project I've been working on with one of my PhD students while I'm here. So I have to acknowledge one Fulbright Iceland, the commission, Belinda, Victor, Hilda, thank you so much for all of your help getting us here. It was an amazing feat. My host, Stani Samenson from the University of Iceland and a collaborator who's the director of the Icelandic Forest Service, Throster Eistensen, as well as my three graduate students who always get involved in every project I work on. I'll be presenting some of Celeste's work that we've been working on while I've been here. And then a host of other collaborators from federal and state agencies, volunteers, and my funding along the bottom. So I'm a fluvial geomorphologist, which means I'm interested in how rivers shape the landscape. And early work on how alluvial rivers, so those rivers that can deform their boundaries because they're made up of unconsolidated sediments, really was based on looking at how water and sediment move through these channels and change and create their shape, both in the cross section 
and in a plan form looking down from above as if you were looking at it on a, from an airplane. And this research finally dovetailed with that of riparian ecologists in the late 1900s and early 2000s to understand the role of vegetation on influencing this channel form. And it turns out that yes, there's a reciprocal relationship. Fluvial systems, river systems provide the substrate onto which plants grow, but once plants establish, they can actually hold rivers in place and really influence what comes after that. And this has been known to reach back as far as 300 million years ago, when the evolution of land plants along rivers gave rise to a change in a transition from what you can see here is a multi-thread, what we call a braided plan form, to the picture on the right, similar of the Yellowstone River, a single thread meandering, whereby the weathering of rock creates these soils that are held in place by the plants. So plants aren't the only way to stabilize banks, but an important one and one that I'm gonna focus on here. So my research looks at more current processes and much shorter time scales than over 300 million years. I'm really interested in how plants that grow in the channel deflect and perturb the flow field. And there's a single plant here called giant cane and flowing in a river and it decreases the velocity. There's deposition that occurs around the base of the plant because of its high frontal area and its roughness or its drag on the flow. And then how that gets translated to the cross-section scale where floods of different heights will inundate different plants. At some point they pronate and it alters the flow field and changes the hydraulic roughness. So that's sort of one scale that I'm interested in, these vegetation channel interactions. What happens when we remove that vegetation? And that's Celeste's research that I'll talk about. In the case of Iceland, what happens when we put it back? And then on some of the larger scale, what happens when we actually look at a larger river network and evaluate what happens when we increase the sediment supply from upstream on a channel cross section, drive meander migration, such as on this bend here, it would migrate to the left on the Yellowstone River and create floodplain surfaces that get established by cottonwood and held in place and generate this beautiful cottonwood forest over time. So the organization of my talk is that I'll be presenting a little bit of Celeste research. We've been working on this over the last month together since I've been here. And then I'll dive into the ideas and what I hope to achieve for um, Icelandic rivers, looking at afforestation and channel characteristics. And then I'll talk a little bit about the professional and personal experiences I've had here over the last month. So non-native vegetation was introduced into the Southwest United States in the early 1920s. And primarily Russian olive, you see here this sort of blue gray vegetation in the upper right, as well as salt cedar and tamarisk. And this was introduced to control erosion. There was worry about um, block navigation of rivers and as well as erosion that was going to threaten the water supply capacity of um, important reservoirs. That vegetation spread rapidly throughout all of the southwestern states in the US. And you can see that by the early 2000s, it had spread as far as Northeast Arizona, an area where we're working is called Canyon de Chez National Monument. And in this upper left photo by the iconic um, um, and famous photographer Ansel Adams, this is Chinle Wash in Canyon de Chez. And you can see that it's very wide and shallow and has a braided multi-thread plan form. Well, skip forward to 2005, and you can see that this in, these invasive plants of Russian olive and salt cedar have really filled the entire floodplain. It was important to keep this open because there's a lot of, um, the, the Navajo Nation occupies this region. It's jointly managed by the National Park Service and the Diné people, and they relied on overbank flooding to irrigate their corn crops every season and the introduction of this vegetation blocked the channel in place, decreased its width, and allowed it to incise such that it disconnected the channel with the floodplain. So no longer could flood annually. And these Navajo peoples ended up having to move out of the canyon. So in a joint project, 
with the National Park Service and the Navajo Nation, they decided to remove vegetation along Chinle Wash in 2005, so this photo is 2006, vegetation surveys were redone in 2015 and again in 2019. And I'll be showing you some photos from location five here in the next slides. Invasive vegetation removal is big business in the US. You can see that my um, figure down here of over $6,000 to over $12,000 per hectare to remove. Um, you can see what that is in Icelandic kroner, and it takes various forms. Heavy equipment can come in and mechanically remove the whole plant, just rip it up. The cut stump method cuts the stump, retains the root structure, but then an herbicide is applied. Chemical pesticides and herbicides are sprayed from the air. Biological agents are introduced for grazing or for insects, or they rely on fire and flooding. But what's missing is this post-removal follow-on. Everyone loves to pull it out, but no one really likes to monitor what happens. And so one question Celeste is asking is what really are the controls on channel form, so its shape, after the vegetation is removed? Removal method, of course, is important. Flow, the sediment, and then the vegetation reestablishment. And so why this is important is because of this real data gap on missing information on post-removal channel forms and an approach that systematically quantifies how these channels change and links them to what we call process drivers. What are the processes that actually alter channel form? And then ultimately the applied piece will be to guide channel restoration going into the future because there's ongoing removal in very broad swaths of the Western US. You can see this map showing six U.S. Western states, and each of these dots indicates locations where vegetation has been removed, but for which there hasn't been monitoring follow-on. And the pictures here are the Rio Grande River in um, Big Bend National Monument, where they're looking at fire to remove, but then you can see this vegetation is sitting there, destabilized and ready to be um, transported downstream. So Celeste is ended up going to these particular sites. There's a lot of intensive field-based data collection. This is Canyon de Chez. Chinle Wash is shown here flowing from right to left. And we built a structure from motion model from drone-based imagery that we collected in 2019. And she's hypothesizing that the whole plant removal will actually increase cross-sectional channel area over time because of reduced hydraulic roughness and decreased cohesion. And I wanna point out this novel experimental design that we, we benefit from. We can see that there's a control reach up at the upper part, okay? There's a cut stump, so, so no vegetation was removed from the control reach, a cut stump that's about 200 meters, a buffer, and then this whole plant removal that we're gonna focus on um, in this next slide. And this took place in six different locations in Canyon de Chez. So what Celeste is doing, part of her analysis is acquiring historical air photos, both pre and post vegetation removal, and orthorectifying those in GIS and delineating the channel plan form. And what you can see here is between 1997 and 2019 is that the channel went from more sinuous and much narrow to spreading out, actually occupying more of that original floodplain and becoming more complex and being reconnected to the floodplain. And she's quantified that about there's been a 50% increase in channel cross-sectional cross area over time. So the ongoing research will continue to look at removal methods at multiple sites. She's going to try to have a sample size of about 30. Also looking at flow for Canyon de Chez specifically, we know there was a big flood in 2019, even though the precipitation was less than other years. This is due to the very spotty episodic nature of rainstorms in the Southwest. Looking at sediment properties, both in the bank and that being transported along the riverbed, as well as vegetation reestablishment. So you take vegetation out and nature abhors a vacuum. So vegetation grows very quickly in return. And so we're quantifying both the native understory in these upper plots for the different treatments and the non-native understory for three different time periods. So we know we're looking at what happens when you remove vegetation. I'm really interested in what happens when you put it back. 
And Palmer's presentation was a perfect introduction to what I'm doing. And so I'm so grateful that I don't really have to talk much about the afforestation efforts. So that was a, a, a very nice lead in. And I don't think I'm telling anyone anything new when I present that soil erosion is one of the very biggest environmental challenges facing Iceland. And about 50% of the vegetation um, and the soil that was present when Norse settlers came in the ninth century, that has been lost. And in the early 1900s, this prompted Iceland to take some mitigation efforts through the Soil Conservation Service and the Icelandic Forest Service, whereby afforestation efforts began in earnest. What's missing, however, and I've noted that there isn't any data that exists on what's the role of channel erosion, both the enlargement and the extension of channels in propagating this larger scale landscape degradation. Channel erosion in and of itself is not problematic. It's a natural process of dynamic rivers. It's a problem when it becomes excessive. Um, it's also a problem when it threatens road and um, bridge infrastructure. And so I'm looking, we'll be looking at how extensive this is and how much of a problem is this in terms of the broader question about landscape degradation. The picture here on the right is this um, from Andy Dugmore's paper. You can see the erosion spots and the roof of bards that you all see as you're driving around. But I'll be spending time along rivers that have eroding banks and looking at how plants stabilize banks. Plants give additional cohesion through a couple of ways. One is mechanical. They just reinforce the soil through tensile strength. There's a hydrologic component of, of reinforcement, and that's just by reducing the moisture through interception of the canopy and also transpiration. Plants can also destabilize banks by adding additional mass and some matrix suction if they get dried out um, too extensively during droughts. So I did find one figure from a paper that I really love by Andy Dugmore um, that documents degradation over time, but he just gives this very slight reference to it in a figure caption. And so I contacted him and he says, no, I don't have any data, but I'm really glad you're looking at this. So let me show you this figure. These are longitudinal profiles and then adjacent cross sections from the pre london through 1947 going A, B to C. And what's shown is, and I, I um, put the red rectangles around the boxes I want you to focus on, is glaciers up here in gray with proglacial rivers draining them in the gray, reaching out to the coast with birched as this stippled pattern here. And that he alludes to the fact that removal of these birch woodlands over time has increased erosion, showing this increased gray area of um, eroding soft soil sediments. And what I'm positing is that this removal of birch woodlands actually changed the channel morphology and we would probably see it move to multi-thread in some of these regions. And so the conceptual model that I've put together for my work here looks at really two different aspects of channel stability and the existence of plants. And that's looking at reaches where that have been afforested, giving a plant dominated um, condition where we have increased bank cohesion and those that have not been afforested or are protected um, over the past decades. Those would be sediment dominated and they're going to lack a bank cohesion. And in addition, there'll be some support for the single thread meandering platform because of the presence of vegetation, whereby sediment dominated ecosystems will actually show greater braiding and uh, multi-thread plant forms. With this threshold that I'm hoping that I might be able to just even qualitatively infer, moving up and down as ice breakup floods, tephra fallout, overgrazing pathogens alter the flow, the sediment transport, the grain size, and hence the riparian vegetation and bank cohesion characteristics. So I'm asking two main questions. What are the afforested species and the density at which they're getting planted that provide the maximum bank cohesion? And then what is the role of channel erosion in this broader landscape scale degradation? And these are important. It's the first time that these specific plants will have been quantified for bank cohesion and that it fills a, a knowledge gap 
in what we know about landscape degradation and the role of channel erosion, and then trying to identify a threshold of vegetation. How much do you need to actually shift plant forms from a, an eroding braided plant form to a stable meandering um, plant form? And then I really do want to develop some guidelines that help inform future afforestations, as well as the engineering efforts where now they're putting big basalt boulders along rivers, it's called riprap. Maybe I can shift the focus to trees and putting in trees for the dual benefit of providing bank stability, but also helping afforested a largely treeless landscape. So my study sites so far are still being selected. I'm choosing, um, and I've been up to the Fnjoskau in North Iceland, where it's been fenced to protect birth, birch woodlands. I hope to find a northeast river, either a tributary of the Grimsa or Gilsa, and I realize there's a lot of Grimsa and Gilsa rivers, um, Gilsa rivers in Iceland, so I'm going to have to um, somehow discern names for these a little bit more specifically. I've been to the Sandau in South Iceland, which has birch that have been protected, and there's some planting for 20 to 60 years, and then I also want to find some places in West Iceland, in the Borgarfjörðurs. So I'm open to sites if you have any, especially Palmer, places where that I can find a forested and non a forested as controls. And what I'll do is I'll be spending a lot of time along cut banks or the eroded banks of a forested or protected and non a forested reaches of these rivers. I'll be using a vegetation grid to measure root characteristics. And I'm gonna be measuring and seeing these mycorrhizal fungi that um, Palmer mentioned. And so I'll need to also identify vegetation functional groups. So just cluster them into groups, measure basal forest area up on the floodplains, and then measure bank characteristics of the height, the slope, I'll quantify grain size, and then the soil texture. With that, I'll calculate the cohesion due to roots for each species that has been used in afforestation efforts. I am not measuring the tensile strength of rocks, that requires a root puller. This is a winch with a load cell attached to it where you pull a root until it breaks and you actually quantify the tensile strength of each root. And I'll be um, relying on published values by Simon and Coll Collison for at least the genera in this area. I will be measuring the root area ratio. The angle of distortion is the bank height or in this, if I see bank failed slopes and then the angle of internal friction of the particular soil type. And what I anticipate in my analysis is preparing figures similar to this on the left and the right. And what's interesting here is this is depth on the y-axis and mean number of roots on um, the x-axis. And what's been shown by studies in the southeastern US is that grass roots, like the sweet gum, provide more co cohesion near the surface, trees, provide deeper roots, which you would expect. But that overall root distribution is greatest within the first meter. Beyond that, it's below. And it's outside of the annual range of water table fluctuations for mo most plants. But what I'm so interested in is that of the species tested for bank strength, turns out that sycamore and birch provided the greatest stability and willow the least. This is interesting because willow is used extensively in the US for restoration efforts. And people put it in because it's fast growing um, and it takes well, but it may not be one of the best species to actually use in, during afforestation. And then I also hope to look at some more um, like three-dimensional plots where I can look at the combination of the tensile strength, the maximum root diameter and the lateral root extent and try to find out which Functional groups approach this H or the high bank cohesion versus low. And you can see that trees and shrubs or the woody vegetation provides the greatest bank cohesion in areas that have already been analyzed in both the Rocky Mountains and the Southeastern US. On the broader scale question of what's the role of, of river erosion in, in landscape degradation, I'm compiling historical air photos. Here's the 19. 45 air photo of a reach of the Fnjoskau that I'm studying versus a 2020. And I'll be looking for changes in width of the channel, as well as what we call network extension. So how rivers 
head cut and migrate back upstream and expand the footprint of the river network. And it looks as if there's some extension into areas of the adjacent hillsides in just my cursory analysis here on the Finausco. So my concluding research thoughts are that I'm really interested in working across scales, both similarities and differences across scales to fully understand the vegetation influences on channel systems. I'll be helping build out a database of plant specific information so that we can really establish a functional relationship between what plant provides what added component of bank strength um, and channel morphology and then help the Icelandic Forest Service develop guidelines to really bring a focus on to rivers and riparian areas and also engineering efforts in stabilizing channels. And I love that Palmer introduced this joke. I want to provide another version of the answer is what do you do if you're lost in an Icelandic forest? Well, you can stand up, but you can also climb a tree because there are large enough trees to climb in Iceland. And I'm hoping that all of you get a chance to enjoy the really the beauty and the solace of hiking in an Icelandic forest. In putting together this slide of my professional and personal experiences and benefits, I created this professional sphere and this personal sphere, and I realized that there is a lot of overlap. And the Fulbright experience is square at the center. It brings the full person to bear, almost to the point of really being able to merge the circles. So I'm so grateful for all of the professional experiences that have turned personal in the shared hikes to the volcano and the shared meals and being included in their conversations. And here's just a list of some of the people and it's growing that have reached out to me um, and have been interested in my research. Um, I am an enigma in the geology department here. They do not know what to do with me because I've actually been talking to ecologists and biologists and I have them talking to each other and they're two floors apart, but they actually often don't even really know each other and what each other does. So there's lots of reciprocal um, uh, benefits in that way, working with others on their field projects, interacting with students, the research presentations, collaborating on proposal the articles. And we're also talking about exchanges in the US. I would love to host any of these um, individuals and all of you if you ever want to come to Colorado State University. So I'm finding that what's fascinating about this is that it takes me beyond the visitor and I've really been able to part the curtain and enter the culture and the people and the landscape in a way that I have never experienced. I've been here a month and I'm absolutely blown away. So there I have lots to do and lots of field work and I'll be um, very busy. Uh, feels very short given that the month has already gone by but I'm looking forward to bringing back a lot of information and data and include my graduate students much of this material will um, creep into my classes. My colleagues at the university will benefit my family. And then I'm looking to get involved in some outside collaborations, um, including helping build the Fulbright Forest, which I love. Uh, helping with a Fulbright Haze program later in the summer. I'm gonna be volunteer planting with the Icelandic Forest Service, and I continue to enjoy a daily exploration. So with that, and I'd love to answer any questions.